Oh, Yuma, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, as a way, just to further that introduction, thank you very much for that. Um, I've worked in cultural institutions for the past 15 years. I've worked both in galleries, museums, and now in an archive context. I primarily worked in collection data management roles as a data steward, uh, cataloger, um, really focusing around collection data and collection data management. This year, I moved from the National Gallery. I've been there for 10 years, and I moved to the National Film and Sound Archive. So this is my first experience working in an archive. Um, and as mentioned, I manage the Data Integrity and Analytics Unit. National institutions share the same role to share, preserve, sorry, to collect, preserve, and share national collection, each honing in on their specialized domain of cultural objects and context. I'm going to focus primarily on the National Film and Sound Archive, but bring some other interesting concepts and uh, information about other inst institutions, national institutions. Um, so today, oh, my numbers are a bit wacky. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> firstly, um, yes, I will give a bit of an overview of the National Film and Sound Archive talk about the data landscape, its data landscape, examine the present condition of vocabulary use within cultural heritage, and we'll discuss the new drivers prompting a shift in the landscape and then pivot to next steps for the NFSA data revolution. I'm gonna concentrate on the future of data standards, data models and vocabularies that would chart the course for our institution's advancement. Australians were early adopters of film and sound technologies, and the appetite to make, enjoy, and discuss audiovisual culture remains strong. Australians have a long standing connection with film and sound dating back to 1890s, and the National Film and Sound Archives collection origins trace back to 1930. It was initially part of the National Library of Australia before becoming independent in 1984 and taking on the building. Um, that's not too far from here. The collection is diverse with more than 4 million holdings spanning news, film, radio, um, home movies, oral histories, and more recently, video games and podcasts. Beyond media, it archives Australia's history, audiovisual history, through costumes, scripts, props, and relics, like megaphones, radios, and this cool Game Boy that you see on here, the Aussie Game Boy as well as MP3 players as well, and far more. As well as preserving these items for future generations through digitization and safe storage practices, the NFSA continues to grow the collection, ensuring it provides unbroken record of life in Australia and of Australian creativity. Unlike galleries and museums of smaller targeted, with smaller targeted collecting practices, the NFSA has a high volume of material brought in each year, sourcing from industry contributions, public domains, and through strategic collection, collecting. So this is a new concept to me, just the sheer amount that we collect each year. The NFSA provides access to the collection via public exhibitions, screenings, and online platforms. It facilitates private collection and data access requests, collaborates with artists and film and TV industry, the audiovisual, the audio industry and Hass researchers. With 121 million viewings in 2021, NFSA stands as a critical cultural resource, keeping Australian collective memory alive and accessible. The National Film and Science Sound Archive, like many cultural institutions, has evolved its cataloging methods to keep pace with technological advancements. Initially, the meticulous process of cataloging involved manual writing out, write, manually writing out details on cards, which were then filed in cabinets accessible to those who could navigate the system. As digital advancements took hold, these card systems were replicated electronically. Um, capturing these essential details like identification, location, description in a digital format. This shift has made the archive's wealth of audio visual history far more accessible and has set the stage for future innovation in how we preserve, explore and interact with our cultural heritage. 
Over the past 15 to 20 years, media research has thoroughly analyzed a wider range array of content types, ranging from conversational news outlets to the transient trends in TikTok and spanning the gamut of mainstream entertainment to the gaming industry. This diverse assortment of media not only showcases esteemed artist work, but also captures the everyday interactions that weave together the tapestry of modern social life. So our cataloging landscape at the FSA is shaped by a diverse range of influences, but not that kind of influences. I'll speak to those influences now. At the NFSA, our cataloging practices have largely been dictated by the data model and the fields in the system that we use with some modifications to accommodate our collection's distinctive elements. Adoption of international standards have ensured we speak the same archival language as our global counterparts. The varied nature of our collection itself demands specific data treatment differentiating how we handle technical data for analog material versus digital material and varying cataloging methods for documenting, for how we document documents or moving image and audio material. Interacting and updating legacy data, so integrating and updating legacy data is an ongoing process and I guess challenge for us to align with contemporary cataloging norms. We also incorporate industry-specific vocabularies and metadata that are standards within audiovisual sectors. So in the cultural heritage sector, cohesive language is not just a convenience, it's a necessity for interruptibility and knowledge sharing. It enables professionals from different institutions and disciplines to communicate effectively, ensuring that information is accurately exchanged and understood. Sharing vocabularies allows for consistent cataloging, indexing and retrieval of information. This consistency is critical for research as it provides a reliable framework for scholars to locate and reference material across various collections and platforms. Moreover, a shared language facilitates collaborative projects between institutions such as traveling exhibitions or digital archives where multiple organizations contribute to a singular narrative. Without cohesive language, the risk of misinterpretation and data inconsistency increases, potentially leading to a fragmented user experience. A unified language is pivotal for public engagement with our collection. It demystifies the academic or technical jargon, making the treasures within our collection accessible and reliable to the wider community. When the public can easily understand and interpret the information presented, their connection to the material deepens, fostering educational enrichment and cultural appreciation. After all, it is the nation's collection. The integration of fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable vocabularies concepts enhance accessibility of cultural and historical resources. It allows the public to effectively search and locate items of information, irrespective of the institution that possesses these resources. Emphasizing fair principles will ensure that these resources are not only easily navigable, but also meaningful, fostering interruptibility and reuse. Thus, a cohesive language adhering to the fair concepts is critical for cultural heritage. Sorry, that was my arrow pointing to vocabularies working for our audiences. Um, the effectiveness of vocabularies in the cultural sector relies heavily on diligence and ongoing maintenance, as you would all be aware. This principle is demonstrated by the National Film and Sound Archive with its preservation glossary that is available online. In shaping our cataloging methodologies, the NFSA draws upon a wealth of international vocabularies, ensuring compliance with global standards and fostering interoperability this includes the International Federation of Film Archive, Moving Image Catalog Manual, the Resource Description and Access for Global Cataloging Norms that I will talk about shortly. We align with the International Federation of Library Association and Institutions Cataloging Principles and make use of the Library of Congress genre and form terms. The International Association of Sound and Audio Archives Cataloging Rules are also a reference point for us. 
Now nationally, oh, sorry, I didn't show you them all. <laughs> sorry, I can't see the screen as easily. Um, move like this. Uh, so nationally, some examples, the Museum of Applied Arts and Science, known as the Powerhouse, has developed an object thesaurus in line with the Art and Architecture Thesauri from the Getty Research Institute, tailored to reflect Australian perspective. This platform encourages contributions and updating from the community, representing a model of interactive vocabulary management. And whilst working at the National Museum of Australia, we utilize this, this, um, the, the powerhouses, the sorry, for our object descriptor. The National Library Union Catalog demonstrate, demonstrates the benefits of sustained enhancement and careful management, evolving from a basic catalog to an expansive resource. It underscores the enduring importance of these vocabularies for enabling research and public engagement with our collection, collective collection, cultural assets. The Geddes Thesaurus of Geographic Place Names and the Gazetteer of Australian Place Names are key resources for cultural institutions. These provide comprehensive databases for geographic and Australian place names um, ret retrospectively and are continually continuously updated with contributions from various projects and institutions. Integration of these at the NFSA could be one way we could significantly improve the way we manage place data. So the new drivers, when transitioning from its traditional card cataloging, the NFSA initially adopted a similar approach for its electronic system emphasizing pre precise item description and identification over contextual information. And this is not unique to the NFSA. However, there have been some recent shifts towards emphasizing the contextual and storytelling aspects of collection. This change par parallels discussions for the Reconsidering Museums Canadian National Project, aimed at understanding the value of museums to Canadians. A notable contributor to this project, Wendy Fitch, shared insight on this topic at a, in a podcast exploring why museums matter. It's no longer simply training people how to catalog an art, artifact or how to physically take care of an artifact. It's about collecting stories and sharing those stories and encouraging museums to let go of control and encouraging them to let those marginalized communities tell their own stories and not try to control what those stories are. Currently, the NFSA faces a significant challenge. While the cataloging database serves specialists well, it creates a barrier for the general public with jargon, complex structures, impeding easy access and understanding and easy access to the collection itself. To bridge this gap, a data transformation project is critical, aiming to make the collection more intuitive and discoverable for everyone, fostering broader insight and engagement. However, as this data is manually entered and stored in uncontrolled state, we are hitting hurdles when analyzing, relating and publishing on our search, the collection website. The demand to pinpoint accuracy in navigating our collection is surging, driven by diverse user cases, with television networks scouring for specific footage to use in their news pieces, individuals on a quest to undercover clips featuring their relatives, an artist in search of the perfect visual element. This underscores the essential need for precision in our archival search capabilities. Galleries and museums who have gone before us in contextualizing their data and adopting thesaurus-based vocabularies, such as the Getty Art and Architecture Thesauri, have increased their collections discoverability. However, to quote a paper, oh, sorry. Oh my gosh, I'm on the wrong side. To quote a paper, <laughs> um, on AI for a role changing in television archives, it's become increasingly impractical for television archives to catalog their collection without automatic processing and artificial intelligence, intelligence technologies. To put it simply, due to the sheer volume of backlog and the influx of new media, it's not feasible to rely solely on manual cataloging. 
Consequently, we're exploring alternative methods, including leveraging large language models and other AI tools to manage our growing needs effectively. Essentially, we're looking for technological alternatives that replace, as far as possible, part of the indexing and documentary description work that has been carried out manually in archives. We aim to augment the, the expertise of curators, exploring technologies to shoulder the more repetitive tasks, thus freeing our human experts to apply their irreplaceable judgment and creativity where it matters most. Now, as we peer under the hood, you've already seen my slides, so I'm a bit disappointed with my timing of this. But anyway, as we peer under the hood of the data engine, we are confronted with a compelling need to evolve. Our current system, akin to a vintage car, has served us well in the past, but now requires a significant overhaul to keep pace with the digital era's demands. Despite best efforts to adopt international standards, other influences have trod in our way. Now, in navigating our data strategy, we're honing in on three pivotal areas to modernize and strengthen our approach. We aim to merge our narrative-driven intellectual data with our granular technical data that caters for both professionals and the public. We're moving beyond simply counting physical and digital holdings to develop richer uh, metrics and adopt a knowledge graph informed by the FIBA principles, which will revolutionize discoverability and con connectivity. Our goal is to impose control and structure to our metadata. The NFSA's current approach to vocabularies is split into two separate paths, intellectual data. This encompasses titles, summaries, credits, the narrative elements of convey the story and the cultural context. Then we have our technical data. Here we delve into the specifics, time codes, usage rights, file format, and more, focusing on operational aspects of the collection. The challenge lies in merging these two streams into a unified cataloging system that is both comprehensive for professionals and accessible to the public. To date, we have integrated the resource description and access, or RDA, as a cataloging standard created for, it is a cataloging standard created for digital environments. RDA's forward thinking framework guides us to create detailed and user-friendly metadata for our collection. So why RDA? Well, it's simple. RDA aligns with our commitment to preserve and share Australia's rich audiovisual heritage. The standard is based on the AACR, the Anglo-American Cataloging Rules. Designed with a more international scope, RDA established a clear line in separating between the record of data and the presentation of data. The major focus of the RDA is providing guidelines and instructions on recording data to reflect attributes of and relationships between the entities defined in the FIBA and FRAD. This standard supports our aim to make collections as accessible and discoverable as possible. The RDA is tailored to accommodate a wide range of formats, both digital and physical, reflecting the diverse type of media found in our collection. It places a high emphasis on the need for the, of the user, ensuring the information provide, provided helps then find, identify, select, and obtain the resource they're looking for. RDA is grounded in, in internationally agreed principles, making it applicable across different countries and types and institutions. And lastly, the RDA's guidelines are structured to work well with linked data technologies, which allows the NFSA to share metadata both easily and effectively on the web. So a bit more about our data specifically and data models. The collection is currently measured at a holding level. We count our physical material by carrier with its independent items such as film reels, tapes, objects, documents, photographs, and we count our digital material by file. So this includes supplied and made files from high preservation quality to our browse quality versions, but does not include any backups. 
So what does this mean for an individual title? Well, take, Taking Mystery Road, a feature film in the collection, we have three physical carriers and 137 unique files. So for this one movie, we have, or feature film, we have 140 added to the 4 million holdings count. Okay, we are starting to unpack this count and looking to delve, deliver new baselines that offer deeper insight into the collection. This involves not only technical change, but also a conceptual shift in how items in the collection are viewed, not as isolated records, but as part of a larger narrative web. This will require a transformation of existing data where relationships are defined and vocabularies are shared, are standardized, sorry, and data is enriched to fit the new model. So we are looking at integrating concepts, obviously um, making it fit for our purpose, but taking from what already is out there. We've been looking at the functional requirements for bibliographic records model. Um, it's a concept conceptual entity relationship model developed by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. It comprises three groups of entities. So on-screen group one, expression, manifestation, and item. This represents the product of intellectual or artistic endeavor. Group two is entities are people, fam family and corporate bodies responsible for the custodianship of group one's intellectual and artistic endeavors. And then group three are entities, oh, sorry, I had group three there already. Um, group three is the yellow. Uh, entities are subjects of group one and two intellectual endeavors and include concepts, objects, events, and place. While um, our current model that we use for our collection is loosely follows the FRBR group one and two entities, it inadvertently conflates entities and different of different natures, like a feature film with a prop under the work categorization. Recognizing this, we're committed to clarifying and refining these categories, and we're also acknowledging the absence of defined structures for groups three, the subjects. Our goal is to enhance our model to distinctly represent all relevant entities and their relationships, ensuring a more coherent and functional classification that aligns with our evolving needs. The knowledge graph, which will hinge off our collection data model is our blueprint for modernization um, of our um, modernizing our data into a dynamic interconnected network. So this network comprises nodes representing entities, the film, director, soundtrack, and edges, which are the relationships between these entities. It is the network that creates a more holistic understanding of our collection, showing not just individual items, but a rich tapestry of connections between them. Edges are fundamental in illustrating the interconnectivity between various entities in the archive. For example, an edge may link a film node to a director node, symbolizing the directed by relationship. Another edge might connect a soundtrack to a composer, indicating the composed by relationship. Transitioning to this knowledge graph paradigm marks a profound shift for cataloging single items to mapping a complex web of cultural narrative and relationship allowing for a nuance and, concept and contextual discovery experience, along with relating the other entity types, such as people, place, and events. The goal is to provide a comprehensive view that connects the work's original concept to all of its subsequent expressions and tangible items within the archive. The knowledge graph approach allows these connections to be easily made and understood, providing a richer and more contextual experience for researchers, historians, and the general public. Vocabularies will also play a pivotal role in our data transformation as they act like translation tools, transforming raw data into structured, meaningful information. The current state of metadata presents challenges for us. A feature in our discovery work has been geographic information. 
The NFSA's database contains place data in various fields, a lot of them free text fields. And unstructured, uncontrolled is creating limitations in collection, navigation, and use. On this challenge, we will look to, we are looking to leading institutions who have integrated tools such as the Gettys Thesaurus of Geographic Place Name and Gazetteer of Australian Place Name. We will also look at leveraging projects that map collection data to Wikidata for creating accessibility and sharing potential. The integration of a structured place name vocabulary into a cataloging system would into our cataloging system would significantly enhance the precision, consistency, and interconnectedness of our collection metadata concerning geographic location. The TGN, for example, provides authoritative names along with variants in different languages and historical periods, ensuring that all records re reference refer to the locations consistently. A controlled vocabulary place names would enhance the user's ability to find all relevant items associated with a particular location, regardless of the variation of the data entry. TGN would widely use and is widely used and recognized, which would enable us to link our data with other collections resources that also use the TGN, creating a more connective and enriched web of information. The, the structure Structured information in TGN includes hierarchical relationships between place, providing a more detailed and nuanced representation of geographic data in our collection. So the journey ahead, as we deconstruct and rebuild our data engine, vocabularies are at the forefront of our strategy. Our primary audience remains in-house our internal team dedicated to harness insight and craft strategies for data. Yet our research extends far beyond our walls. We have a longstanding tradition of providing access to researchers in the humanities, arts, and social science field, offering our catalog as a resource for generic user tasks of finding, identifying, selecting, obtaining, and exploring. The content as data approaches gaining traction Appeal to, appealing to those who seek to delve deeper into the data, exploring the social narrative that lies within. Both descriptive cataloging data and the containers themselves can be utilized for derived insight where voc vocabularies once concealed are shared. We're expanding the possibilities of new data applications from maintaining raw transcripts to structured entities, all while being cognizant of the bias that has crept into our collection. Similarly, our catalog data, when interlinked with new raw data, serves as a connector, unlocking the archive to greater audiences. Our vision is not to view our collection merely as a series of items, but to embrace it as an integrated body of data, ripe with semantic richness. This approach caters not just to the traditional house researcher, but also to those engaged in innovative, innovative innovative interdisciplinary research. We're mindful of the complex rights that encircle some of our material as we build our solutions. Our commitment is to serve both the general and advanced researchers, ensuring that our collections are as informative as they are inspiring. Visual analytics in culture offers us ways to discern patterns and identify topics. This is explored in a, through a recent artist acquisition. The NFSA collaborated with artist Jazz Money in creating a motion picture solely from footage in the collection. Uh, find me in the break if you wanted to know anything more about this project, I'll give a brief overview of it now. Her work in, um, exemplifies the potential of the less manual, more intuitive process, allowing us to glimpse the unexpected within our collection her use of footage for me personally was both educational and captivating. So as we move forward, it is the, cons the constant evolution of our vocabularies that will ensure our cultural heritage institutions remain relevant and an avenue for all Australians and the world to engage with culture. Um, that's it from me. So thank you for listening and um, be welcome to take any questions. I also have with me two colleagues um, Basil and Paul from the NFSA. So if there's anything to me um, relating to the NFSA, because I've only been there since March, I may deflect.
with the panel discussion at the end. So we'll kick off with Rob Atkinson from OGC Australia. Thank you. Hi there. Yeah, Rob Atkinson. OGC, not so much Australia only, it's uh, international. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, uh, though I do live in Wollongong, Darawa land, and I pay my respects to the elders. Uh, um, uh, so I'd like to riff on some of the themes we've uh, we've discussed uh, and extend a little bit by thinking about the R in reuse in, in fair. So um, as Leslie pointed out before, we've done a lot of uh, F and A in terms of um, uh, I won't say what it stands for, but um, uh, around uh, uh, fair principles. But ultimately, it's in reuse where the money hits the road, is where you actually get some value out of things. So everything else is just the means to an end. So going back to what Arif and Gregory was saying in the um, the keynote yesterday, now the, the goal here is we really need to achieve machine readability of metadata. And part of that is not putting something at the end of the process, trying to describe what we made but actually surfacing up the actual details. And so creating machine actionable um, metadata is even more important than machine readable. And we need to do that by design. We need to surface the design and the operational status of our systems into metadata automatically, not attempt to retrofit it because uh, we'll never ever get it right. We'll never really understand what we need machine actionable metadata is always going to be a lot richer. We saw things like SSOM and mappings and that sort of stuff. So on the slide, I've got a, um, a little diagram, which is available in the links I'll leave with the organizers, which is a work in progress, which is why I didn't do slides. I'm going to show you uh, some live examples in terms of how we're approaching thinking about reuse of vocabularies in um, applications. So the first thing I want to do is actually unpack the layers of that. There's a thing called the European Interoperability Framework, which is kind of nice. It breaks things down into legal, organizational, semantic, and technical interoperability layers. But when you actually start breaking down individual um, implementations, you end up with something a little bit like what's on screen, where you have a layer in the middle where systems and infrastructures basically identify, well, this is our, this is the common metadata standards, if you like, we need for our components to work together. Individual systems and applications and things within that then have to specialize it for their own particular application use. And so uh, if we think of the digital twins, which we heard um, Oren talking about those, and the examples I'm going to show you from a European project we're involved in uh, called Iliad, Digital Twins of the Ocean, which is feeding in practices to the UN Digital Twins of the Ocean uh, work. Um, you know, we see that the digital twin is sort of like an infrastructure. It's a, it's a platform by which you can plug in data sources and models. And all those different applications of the twin you now will have their own specializations and they have their own set of vocabularies and extensions on top of those cores. The infrastructures are really designed to talk to other infrastructures. It's actually, this is the system of systems interoperability space that they're sort of relatively general patterns. For example, um, we might say that when we have an observation with an observed property, we're going to say that observed property is going to be a URI, not a tech string. Because, and then there's a requirement on our infrastructure that that is actually a vocabulary that's online somewhere. Okay, we may have further constraints that that vocabulary actually resolves to a machine, real, machine readable resource, or we may not. So the point is that each of the systems will create constraints about how to use these more underlying basic sort of standards that things like the OGC um, and, and the W3C sort of um, create. So the OGC is very you know, into creating APIs for accessing features and, and coverages and imagery catalogs and all these sort of spatiotemporal things. And then we have sort of fundamental models underneath that. Um, and so in the W3C space where I'm also active, uh, along with Nick Khan, who's talking later, so forth, we have cross-domain models, observations and measurements, which is called SOSA in there, um, the Providence model, GCAT data cataloging, um, the profiles vocabulary, um, that sort of stuff. Then we have implementation patterns, like in the general features APIs. So we build up these layers of specialization constraints, interoperability uh, domains. And the vocabularies tend to get linked in largely at the very end of that process. 
That's where I specialize and say, my particular application, I want to use this particular vocabulary. I may have a number of vocabularies that are required to classify things within the context of the system. My digital twin wants me to say, okay, right, are you about biodiversity or you know, urban health or you know, psychology of cats or whatever it is. But my individual application needs to worry about okay, what's the actual variables that I'm actually measuring, et cetera. You know, the digital twin doesn't want to constrain that. So a lot of the vocabularies binding appears at the end of this process. And that's where things have fallen down in the past. We've tried to conflate all those things into one interoperability standard all the time. And we always end up in a situation where how that vocabulary is attached to the end has always been loosey-goosey. No one has really done a very standardized way of doing that. There's no commonly used ontology for describing how a vocabulary gets attached to a schema. There is one called RDF data cube, which is reasonably useful. Um, but it's not commonly used for this purpose. There's no offline validation tools for checking my data is using that vocabulary. Okay, so just think about that, okay? We all do make vocabularies and yet our tools really don't support it. Anyway, I'm gonna dive down now into some sort of practical details. This concept of this emergent vocabulary. How do we make the underlying designs of our systems more machine readable so that we can actually have metadata that includes the reuse of vocabularies emerge up to the top and become actionable. So as I said, I didn't prepare slides because this is actually quite dynamic. We're working on a range of projects. I'm gonna show two examples, one from the Digital Twins of the Ocean, and one from the, um, the Cadastral Survey Data Exchange um, project I'm working on with um, ICSM in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and these are online repositories. The first one is public accessible and you can link to, and it's got lots of sort of links to the underlying moving parts that the OGC is building and testing and supporting. And the other one will come online sometime in the next few months in terms of um, uh, being public. So sometime uh, you know, in the new year, uh, that'll be more visible. So I'm just gonna dive backwards. That came from a general discussion about the nature of profiles, which um, is in this particular um, uh, repository. I might point out a couple of things there that these machine readable metadata components, you know, we've got uh, you know, the various project metadata, your typical metadata describing what the nature of it is. But then we've basically got our encodings. We have this, uh, the, um, we have examples of these things. We have JSON schemas, which is the structure. And that's a bit tricky because there's lots of different flavors of JSON schema as a language. We also have shackle, shapes constraint language. Um, which we can express using RDF, knowledge graph technology, a whole bunch of useful constraints. So the trick is, how do I go from a, uh, a JSON schema, which has no semantic information, usefully accessible, to something where I can actually create some semantic rules? So I'm just going to very, very quickly unpack the hood and show you that. The second part of it is that it's all about testing. It's about uh, doing regression testing. So as you build complex applications, it's very easy to break things. So I'm just gonna dive now right into the code and show you very, very quickly. We have a series of some uh, of profiles which layer on top of each other. Sorry, we'll actually show you one last thing before I dive into the code, which is that you know, just, just a little anatomy of the profiles. Sorry, it's there. So in this particular case, we've got a, a, a citizen science project for uh, monitoring jellyfish uh, swarms which sits on top of a generic citizen science profile, which sits on top of the generic um, Iliad Oceans digital twin of the ocean model, which sits on top of the OGC API, SOSA, the sensor observation sampling, which sits on top of the lower level GeoJSON and SOSA. So this, this sort of profile stuff, you know, it's being exercised and they're separate components that are reusable. So diving into the code, just to show you very, very quickly, what lives in one of these sort of things. We have some metadata, which is not particularly interesting, and we'll be working on standardizing that and look, um, thinking about those uh, DOIs and FERs and the requirements we might want to uh, introduce there. We have a schema, which tells us what the pieces are. And this particular schema basically says, I'm um, everything about the observable properties requirements for the ocean information model, well, which is one of the other objects. And my expectation is that I have a, a particular set of results, which has a particular set of properties, quantity of jellyfish, okay. Um, that's pretty much all it has to do. It has to just specialize that one last little bit. That's important as I'll show you in a second. 
Then we have a context document, which is the JSON LD part, which says, oh, okay, our, our result, density of jellyfish, okay, that has this particular URI, and it has a base URI, which allows us to turn the values into a, into a, um, a linked data value. I wanted to highlight this because we're not doing linked data by saying you've got to turn your data into linked data. You don't have to put all your URIs into your data. You can actually um, identify the namespaces for the codes you use and you can retrofit it. So, okay, well, I've only got two minutes left, so I'll, I'll skip the 3D cadaster, which is about handling this for you know, several hundred vocabularies, which is one of those sort of Git processing um, things we can talk about at another date. I was just going to dive finally into what this means in practice is that when I uh, compile and test this, um, talk to me in today, it just has a, this is just a static HTML file. It should not take you that long to talk to me. Okay. So I'm going to make a liar out of me. I've got two network connection. I'm going to use up my two minutes. Okay, there it is. Well, okay, I don't know why that HTML page took so long. Um, so so this is just the machine readable, it's just a compilation, but this is where the, the fun stuff happens. Here's my plain old JSON, and you see I've got a term here, but the property is this jellyfish abundance property. When I apply that context document to create the semantic version, that's now a URI, and if I go to that URI, it links through to the control vocabulary in the vocabulary server which is where you guys kind of know all about it, all that sort of stuff. So I just wanted to very quickly leave you with the idea that this machine readability of design, connecting up all the dots, schemas, APIs, vocabularies, it can be done. And the final last piece is that it, it can be done in a very systematic way. We actually generate uh, validation reports where we do schema validations and we inherit shapes from all the other profiles we're, we're profiling. So we actually pull the validation, the constraints, the vocabulary uses, all that stuff is actually all inherited from all those underlying pieces. So 95% of this little, the, the, the jellyfish pilot is inherited. So the complexity of making it machine readable is actually manageable because I'm not starting from scratch and producing a 2000 page document specifying my the semantics of my data model. I'm inheriting 95% of that, and I can detect that I'm, I'm interoperable with all those underlying component pieces. So I'll leave it there just to show that it is actually possible to have our cake and eat it too against those highfalutin machine readable actionable metadata, but you can only do it by very, very systematic design and testing everything as you go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Howard Johns, and this presentation is on a proposed standard API for vocab systems. I'll be presenting this on behalf of Nick Carr from Currawong AI. So to begin with, I'll give you a quick outline of what's going to be covered in this presentation. Um, I'll start by looking at the motivation for establishing a standard API for vocabs. I'll cover the history around common vocab systems and give you a view into the APIs they currently provide. And I think this will highlight the lack of standards across the vocab ecosystem. Then I'll go over what our proposal is and what that implementation might look like. And we'll also go into, of course, the time frame around the proposal. To begin with, for motivations, there are several reasons for wanting to establish a standard. To start with, vocabularies are very niche and quite often only well understood in their own domains. And even though each vocab system is dealing with similar data models, there is no normal or standard API other systems can use when they're looking to integrate to vocab systems through an API. This is primarily because each vocab system implements a different set of vocab APIs. Finally, searching vocabularies can be performed a number of different ways, and this can depend on the size of the vocab, which languages it uses, and specific tailoring that might be required by a vocab. So that's something else that we see should be provided as part of a standard. When it comes to the current landscape for vocab systems and APIs, if we look at the commonly used vocab systems, there is no standard that has been widely used for vocabs, with the exception of constructing a general Sparkle query. 
Now, there has been efforts to establish standards from the RDA Vocab Services Interest Group. However, we're still in a situation where we have no agreed standard. Now, I'll just quickly go over some of the current APIs that are used across these different vocab systems. And um, I'd like to start with Pool Party. And you'll notice here that they have a number of web services they provide to cover a range of different functionality. And if we look at their vocab related APIs, you'll see that the types of web services and the naming they use for the vocab specific functions um, kind of follow this pattern where you can request a concept scheme and its top concepts or the child concepts within a concept scheme, or you can request a concept subtree. But that gives you a feel for the types of APIs provided by Pool Party. If we compare this to Scosmos, you'll notice many differences. They provide a set of RESTful APIs that provide you access to vocabs. You can query a list of vocabularies. You can view general information about a vocab or you can query the broader or narrower concepts in a vocabulary. But already you can see how different the set of APIs are to Pool Party. Finally, moving on to our VocPress system, it currently provides a simple, specialised, read-only view of vocabs and their concepts. Again, differences are clearly visible between the vocab-related APIs from just these three different vocab systems. So in review, we have RESTful SCOS APIs, a range of custom vocabulary APIs, and they're all implemented differently. And of course, we have a Sparkle interface into the knowledge graph, but that doesn't give you a simplified standard API for other applications to use. In addition to the lack of a standard API, we also don't have a standard search mechanism that allows us the type of flexibility that is often required when searching different vocabularies. I'll now go into what our proposal is um, to move forward towards a standard. We see the need for a vocab specific API that is able to handle the varying specialized search methods that are needed by vocabs. Ideally, we'd like to use an existing open standard that is already established in the community. The standard should also allow for human readable presentation when, viewed, um, when viewing the API through a browser. And of course, we're hoping the API has a chance of one day becoming a standard so it can simplify integrations with vocabs and encourage that wider adoption. To take our proposal a step further, after our experience using APIs from the Open Geospatial Consortium, or OGC, we're in the process of implementing OGC's APIs for geospatial data sets and our catalogues in our own PRES system. Even though their APIs are designed to handle geospatial data, they're also well suited to handling simpler non-geospatial data. And their OGC Records API for catalogues is an API standard that we could use as the basis for proposing a new OGC terminology API that could serve as a standard API for vocabs. It's important to note that OGC's API already supports CQL and extensible search mechanisms, which provide the type of flexibility that we're looking for with vocabs. If we look at the complexity to implement the terminology API, we see it as being more complex than OGC's existing records API due to the additional concept relationships, but simpler than OGC's feature API, which handles the more complex types of geospatial relationships. And for our press system, we're implementing the OGC features API, records API, and their CQL interface. We see the set of OGC APIs as an important set of standards that we can utilise in our own PRES system. If we look at the API structure defined by the OGC APIs, you'll see that they follow a consistent pattern for their records and features API, as, as shown there. These APIs provide access to catalogues, feature collections and their items. For the terminology API, this would follow the similar pattern where we can pass the concept scheme and the concept ID that we're interested in. 
A fairly useful extension we see in the introduction of an overarching is the introduction of an overarching catalog where we can further arrange vocabularies into catalogs and this would similarly apply to having catalogs of catalogs. Extending this approach again, uh, it can be applied across OGC APIs that will also include the feature collections as well. So the addition of the catalog level allows us to use a catalog for any type of collection of information we're looking to organize. For concepts that exist in a vocab or concepts that exist as part of a collection, the following type of pattern could be introduced where we include an additional path to support the retrieval of collections of concepts differently to con uh, concepts in a vocab. But these types of design considerations are what we're currently working through at the moment. For search support, a pattern that could be used is where, we, where the search parameters are used at different points in the API. And with this approach, the API scope defines the items uh, which should be considered when performing our search. This gives us a simple logical method for providing a starting point for our search. When it comes to catering for different search strategies, a strategy parameter can be provided along with the search parameters, and this would indicate the method to use when conducting a search. This gives us a very extensible approach to supporting different search strategies. Lastly, our timeline in our press system for the adoption of OGC APIs is that we expect to complete support for OGC Records API this calendar year, extending our support to OGC Features API for um, the CQL implementation in Q1 2024. And finally, the new terminology API implementation is targeted for Q2 in 2024. So that concludes the presentation. Um, please feel free to send any questions to the email addresses on the slide or visit our websites for more information about Currawong or any of our PRES related tools. Thanks for your time. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Kai Lin and I'm from CSIRO and I work with Michael and I'll, I'll be presenting um, our tool Snapper GoGo, -Go, which is really about facilitating collaborative mapping workflows. Um, sorry. Um, so as part of Austra the Australian Research Data Commons Rosetta project, um, there was a need for a tool that could assist researchers to map local terminologies to international standard vocabularies and terminologies. So that's really about the interoperability as well as the reusable uh, quality mapping development. Uh, Rosetta's objective is to deliver a national, nationally recognised and utilised shared terminology mapping service focused on the needs of information systems delivery, researchers and research in Australia. So Snap to SNOMED was a tool that was um, developed and by CSIRO and it was identified as a potential starting point for the tool, but it did need to support mapping to terminologies other than SNOMED CT, so it required a little bit of enhancement. So I might just start off... Um, um, with just a little bit of background on that Snaptus Nomad tool. Um, Snaptus Nomad was um, developed for Snowmed International as part of their commitment to supporting the adoption of Snowmed in national, regional and local implementations. Um, they recognised the use case that many new implementations required migration of existing codes to be mapped to Snowmed CT, so it could be used natively in um, new software. Um, so to support these implementers, SNOMED International commissioned us to develop an open source tool for mapping local terminologies to SNOMED CT. And that um, is how SNAP to SNOMED um, came about. So their use case was really that requirement to map existing legacy or proprietary code sets to SNOMED for migration of systems, for interoperability, for reporting, for clinical decision support and other use cases similar to those. So what we wanted was an open source tool that supports th that implementation by allowing users to collaboratively create and maintain simple maps to SNOMED using a guided approach to help, um, help, help users. Their vision was really um, a hosted tool for members and their stakeholders so that they could create those maps. Um, there was a 
a group of different stakeholders, so Snowbird International as well as National Release Centres um, and then organisations with those countries. Um, there was a few different needs there um, and there was a, a, a large number of product features that I think are kind of standard to anyone who's creating any kind of map. Um, so the development process of this was done as a collaborative iterative project. Um, it was it had many different stakeholders with many different requirements. So there was an international user group, user group with many of the SNOMED member countries. Those user group did talk about what their mapping requirements are. And I think they kind of um, extend out to like all sorts of groups that do mapping. They had all sorts of different users within their um, mapping team. So sometimes they had BAs, sometimes they had clinicians, sometimes they had researchers. It was really um, really like a wide variety. They had different size teams. Sometimes they only had one resource. Sometimes they had up to 10 or 15. They all had different workflows and different business rules that they needed to um, adhere against. So the development of this tool was really about trying to balance all those different requirements. And so to do that, we needed to try and give a flexible workflow, but still kind of have that guide rails and also um, provide some intuitive design to allow different types of users to be able to use it without um, too much trouble. Um, so Snap to SNOMED, the, uh, its key features were really the ability to create simple maps to SNOMED CT. Um, it needed to be online and easily accessible. Um, for SNOMED International, they wanted to keep the sort of user user list. So you did need to you do need to require you do need a login to their system. And it has an intuitive UI to make browsing and mapping of SNOMED CT easy and efficient. The other key features that I kind of wanted to talk about today was the collaborative workflow component. So at the moment, a lot of people use things like Excel. Um, there's a few proprietary tools out there. We have one called Snapper, but none of those easily use allow like easy collaboration. So teams of users to work together to create a map rather than sending um, spreadsheets or lists of things back and forth for author and review. So our tool allows for um, a single author mapping and a dual author mapping. And I'll go into those workflows in a little bit um, shortly. We also allow for an optional reviewer. Um, it uses task-based work when work is assigned to people or they can be self-assigned. Um, and there's user role-based control per map. So it, within the tool, a person can be assigned different type of membership and that membership will allow them access to the map, but it will allow them to do um, different things in there. So there's a little bit of control there, which is um, often quite important when you're mapping um, health data. So the single author workflow is where you have a set of source codes to be mapped. Each source code can be assigned to a single author or mapper. And then once that mapper has authored that row, um, it can then optionally be assigned to a single reviewer to then review it. So this allows um, to at least two people to work on each source code. So you could have a group of mappers working across each row will be mapped by one mapper and then one reviewer if you need it. Um, the other type of workflow that we had there was um, dual author workflow. This is where two authors map um, a single source code independently and then that um, that the uh, results of their mapping gets compared and then um, depending on whether there's a conflict or not, it would go to another person. So you can see here, um, the the two the source code mapped by mapper one and mapper two it's blinded between them and only after that after they both finish mapping it's unblinded. There's a comparison to say whether there's any conflicts or not. If there's no conflicts, it can be completed there or it can optionally go to a reviewer. If there is a conflict, it can go to a third person who's the reconciler who can then kind of adjudicate and decide which is the appropriate mapping. So sometimes this is useful if you have a clinician who um, is only available part of the time um, and they're able to kind of adjudicate the difficult things to map, you could just assign, they could be there and that's way to help manage your resources. After the reconciler um, does their process, it they can then optionally also um, add in a, a review step there, depending on your business rules. 
Um, another key feature of the Snap to Snowmed tool was to um, allow the creation of new map versions. Um, and the, the, there was an additional ability to allow you to do that map maintenance as well. So where there may be uh, targets that are no longer in scope because they've been made inactive or they're no longer part of your original target code scope, um, it can help you manage those, identify those, and then uh, provide suggestions on replacement. So for Snap to SNOMED, it was able to leverage um, SNOMED CT's terminology features um, by suggesting replacements using um, a historical association reference set. So this diagram just quickly shows sort of that maintenance workflow. Um, you have a map that originally was mapped to the um, July 2019 edition. When you migrate it to the September 2023 edition, one of the targets is identified as out of scope. Um, and so SNOMED has its own historical association um, reference set, which proposes replacements for the map target. And, and the tool will display those to the user in a in a simple fashion so that it's easy to make a decision whether we want to, what we want to do, what action we want to take. Um, other features that are part of this mapping tool is um, automated mapping suggestions. So this can get applied as a bulk operation across a whole map or for um, a selection or for single source term terms. This at the moment leverages um, the FIRE terminology service, which is uh, CSIRO's Onto server, um, as well as SNOMED CT terminology features. At the moment, it uses um, that. It, we don't have any custom algorithms in it at the moment, but we are kind of looking to see what could be exploring that and seeing what could be done there. Um, it does allow you, obviously, to import your own code sets, but it also allows you to import um, any maps that you already have so that you can then maintain them um, moving forward. Um, and it allows you to export to JSON format, CSV, TSV, and Excel format. So if you are interested in using Snap to SNOMED, the scope is uh, to map to SNOMED only, but it is available free to use for users from um, SNOMED member countries. So Australia is one. Um, there's a hosted service available at this address here, but it is also available as um, an open source thing here on GitHub um, and there's documentation associated with it. The only thing with the um, hosted service, you do need a SNOMED International Confluence account. It is free. Um, and you just need to apply um, to Snowman International. Um, and then that brings us to Snapper Go Go. So we took the it's Snap. Just a two minute warning. Oh, thank you. Um, we've just taken Snapper, Snap to Snowman and enhanced it for the ARDC. It's essentially a fork off the Snowman International instance. It still is open source. It now can map sort of any code to any code. Um, it uses AAF authentication so that um, that kind of taps into existing users' authentication systems. Um, we're still kind of working on what the requirements are from the ARDC stakeholders outside of what um, is there with Snap to Snowmed and the extension we've already done. So we are, um, and we are also only um, supporting single author workflow at the moment. And we just want to see who's interested in sort of having that dual authoring because that's a really big requirement in the clinical space, but it may not be so outside of that. Um, and here's just a screenshot of what it looks like. There's, um, you can see here the target and the scope in the top left corner. Um, there's multi You can add multiple versions. Um, we have a tasking workflow on the right. Um, and then sort of down down the table is sort of your imported codes or your target source codes. And then on the right is your target. Um, and that's, that's all I wanted to show. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, checking in, can people, can people hear me? Can people see my screen? I see thumbs up, wonderful. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, my name is Keo Paulson. I'm going to be talking about advancing high formats capacity to leverage multiple vocabularies. Uh, if you want to talk about me or this presentation in the future, I like they, them pronouns. Uh, I've been, I worked on this presentation with my colleagues, Jane Greenberg and Scott McClellan uh, at the Metadata Research Center in, at Drexel University. So what I'm going to be talking about uh, is why we called this platform software Hive, why Hive? Uh, then what is Hive format, sort of a uh, 
iteration of Hive. We're going to talk about the functionality of how Hive format works, talking about the uh, navigating uh, vocabularies, searching within vocabularies, uh, indexing articles uh, across, like according to vocabularies. Uh, we're going to be talking where uh, folks may notice that it uh, appears very similar to some some of those vocabularies mentioned by the previous person uh, or or bio portal or map portal are the ones that I'm more familiar with here in the US. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about some of the recent advancements that I have been working on specifically, and then what we hope to be able to do next with this little platform of ours. So first, uh, why Hive? Hive stands for Helping Interdisciplinary Vocabulary Engineering. Um, what that ends up meaning is that instead of being a repository that uh, maintainers of vocabularies have to sign into and uh, give their vocabularies, uh, our strategy is to go and find lots of vocabularies and uh, that could be on different places. So here for, for me in the US, Library of Congress, subject headings, uh, the RDF is, uh, XML is here. Uh, the asthma ontology, the RDF is in, uh, is in this location. The USGS can find the RDF on this different US government website. Uh, and then uh, this uh, United Astronomy Thesaurus, uh, they have their RDF on GitHub. And instead of having to find all of those and explore all of those in their respective websites, uh, we've downloaded it and put it in this, uh, in. Uh, in one place. So you can see the Asthma Ontology, Library of Congress, Subject Headings, uh, USGS, uh, and Unified Astronomy Thesaurus. So uh, not for building vocabularies, uh, truly for for crawling for vocabularies and putting them, putting them, them in one place, all in one place. So pros and cons of this approach. Uh, pros are that uh, it, it allows for some flexibility to be able to uh, pick and choose the vocabularies that, that you want to be looking for. Um, then because we are crawling for these vocabularies, uh, we don't need as much marketing to to like ask people to submit their vocabularies to still potentially be helpful uh, in terms of searching different vocabularies. Uh, and uh, based on the software that we have, we can pick different collections of vocabularies for different purposes, which we'll see for Hive for Matt or Hive for Material Sciences. Uh, the cons is that uh, at the current moment, uh, as People might be able to imagine, like hearing some of our previous presenters of how there's not a common API, uh, downloading each of those and uh, normalizing them is a very manual process. Um, the, and since they are coming from different sources, uh, the the schema for th those various RDF could be ever so slightly different to normalize into a SCOS. Uh, and then because we don't uh, do as much marketing, uh, we're not as well known in uh, in the academic space or or across like internationally, uh, which we're trying to fix. Hello, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, so then, what is Hive Format? Hive Format uh, is using this Hive technology, but for material sciences um, or vocabularies related to material sciences. As a rundown for material science, the the vocabularies in that space. Uh, have four major facets that vocabularies can be about, either the structure of a material, the properties of that material, the performance of that material under various tests, and the um, the how, how a material is processed to to obtain it all to find the characterization. This this seemed like a helpful uh, iteration, a, a new f version of Hive, because when we talked with our colleagues in the material science domain, uh, they let us know that the literature review process was was very time consuming. And so by uh, with this little platform, uh, people are able to see which vocabulary and which terms might be relevant, the hierarchies to find other adjacent uh, uh, papers and being able to take your own paper and figure out which uh, vocabularies might already exist and and how to uh, how to use keywords or those kinds of things for for your own papers. Uh, so let's take a look at the functionality. Uh, we have uh, navigation of exploring the SCOS-based hierarchies, looking at the notes, the URI, uh, and uh, being able to look at that in different metadata forms. So uh, this is the vanilla version of Hive. And then here is oh, Hive for Matt. Uh, looks very similar. Uh, so common core ontologies, entity, continuant, independent continuant, 
material entity. Uh, let's do object. Organism. Ooh, an animal. A person. Perfect. I'm a person. Um, can look at the the uh, URI here. I was searching. The our presenters were very cool. Uh, so you can see that the URI takes us to the website, which in this case is just the raw XML. Uh, can see the subclass, the superclass, uh, or we can see the 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 uh, broader of animal and the and the narrower of of these different things, and we can see the different uh, formats: uh, JSON, linked data, SCOS, RDF, uh, Dublin Core, XML. Uh, and you can copy those fairly easily as well. Uh, vocabulary search. Uh, we can go into the search. We can pick common different uh, vocabularies here. Uh, pick which ones that you want to search across. Uh, and the example I have here is silver. And so can see, oh, BWD has silver, silver atom, USGS. And you can see the alternative label notes uh, subclass of this uh, and can still see all of these different uh, metadata formats. And we also have article indexing. Uh, so if I take the index here, I'm going to use this Wikipedia article about silver, uh, take the URL. You can also do this for a text file or, or even a PDF on online or on your, on your desktop. I'm going to choose the same vocabularies as I did before. I'm going to use this rake algorithm to do keyword extraction from the article. Uh, index it, and within a second, we can see things that we recognize, silver, silver atom, uh, but also single crystal, dissolved metals, uh, and again, uh, be able to see notes about, about all those things. Uh, so how is this different from other repositories like BioPortal or, or in MatPortal is a equivalent for material science? Um, so I'll just, I'll also go here where, uh, Matt portal, this is the material science equivalent has this annotator function, which, uh, does a similar thing as the indexing. Uh, however, and this is the paragraph, the first paragraph from this Wikipedia article of silver. Uh, but in this first paragraph, uh, the word silver shows up 10 times, not including silverware. And so it found silver from the Matt Onto ontology, like, like Hive did, like mine did, like here, uh, Matt Onto silver. Um, however, because silver showed up 10 different times in the article, it is repeating that silver 10 different times and then 10 times for BWMD dom domain and then times for BWMD mid. So it's it's hard to see them, the, which terms are clearly and it, it it's difficult to navigate uh, the way that it is here. And because they are finding each and every single match, uh, the annotator is limited to 500 words maximum, whereas Hive, uh, because we're doing some keyword extraction, uh, we're able to do basically any size. Of course, if, a, if an article got really big, like 50 pages, 100 pages, it would slow down. Um, but theoretically could do could do any, any size. Uh, so some of the recent advancements that I've been working on, very excited about. Um, is that I uh, was working on the keyword alignment uh, algorithm to align uh, terms from an article to uh, keywords in the various vocabularies. And before the algorithm, uh, we were having trouble pulling any keywords for a corpus that, that we were using related to material science. And afterwards, we were finding we were able to pull keywords with 53% relevance, um, which was an improvement from before. Uh, it's faster. So now, even if I include LCSH, which has over 400,000 terms, and I start indexing, it should resolve within 10 seconds as I'm doing it here. Uh, so another one 1,000. There we go. Uh, see here, see, we have, uh, all of these things from silver, including like silver in literature. And that brings me to the next point that silver in literature, that phrase wasn't exactly mentioned in the silver Wikipedia article, but, uh, the, uh, the algorithm is a little bit more tolerant being able to different, like being able to accept both X hyphen Ray or X Ray in an article, uh, even if words are, are switched around like diffusion X Ray versus X Ray diffusion. Uh, it uses this concept of string distance or string similarity to be able to still find things that are close enough. Uh, and some ambitions for the future of what we're hoping to do Two with this. Warning. Thank you very much. Two minute warning. I heard. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the ambitions for the future is that 
uh, we're hoping to be able to make it faster. So I mentioned before that it's a very um, manual process, hoping to automate that process of updating vocabularies, make it easier to plug and play a new vocabulary um, that based on just how it is currently. Uh, uh, 53% um, is uh, for the relevance is great, uh, but being able to optimize that even more based on some recent results uh, would be great. And uh, being able to have more different, more collections of vocabularies, say hive for museums or hive for literature or hive for insert your discipline here. Uh, and then as we work on this, it would be great to have an open, like I uh, likely we are going to end up uh, building some sort of library to ingest a vocabulary thesaurus ontology or taxonomy and being able to parse that into a more normalized SCOS with uh, minimal um, input uh, seems like something that would be very helpful in the space. Uh, so thank you very much. That's everything that I had. Uh, if you have more questions besides right now, uh, can send it to mrc.metadata at drexel.edu. Uh, yes, uh, supported by the NSF. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Konzak Isirabahenda. I'm currently a PhD student at Babesh Bolia University, Cluj Napoca, Romania. Uh, my subject I want to share with you today, uh, it is about knowledge-based economy vocabularies. Reflection on graduate employability. So, uh, as uh, mega trends and problems, uh, there is a rise of usage of employability skills, capitals, decent, precarious work concept in today uh, rapid changing. Uh, world of work. While importance of employability in a global competitive uh, knowledge economy is recognized, the Romanian labor market now is a home to many outsourcing company and uh, there are many complex issues young university graduates continue to face when transitioning from university to work. Employability, uh, frankly speaking, it's a complex and multidimensional process. Why some consider a fuzzy concept, sometimes lacking clarity and specificity of meaning. Most vocabulary used to describe employability uh, focused on the terms related to job skills, qualification, industry-specific knowledge, and personal attribute valued in the job market. The aim of this uh, presentation, uh, I want to de demystify knowledge-based economy vocabularies, uh, mostly employability and skills. This article wanted to understand and explain what employability means to main social actors. When I mean social actors uh, are employees in managerial, managerial positions such as team lead, managers, HR professionals, and the employees, frontline employees working as a customer support representative in Romania. I also want to shed light on how those uh, social actors describe the concept of employability. The methodology I use uh, to call out this research, this is a, a qualitative design with a reflective thematic analysis and uh, a critical realism approach. This is based on two years of ethnographical case study, which I undertake 2020 to 2022. I use the participants of observation method, semi-structured, semi and unstructured interview method to collect the data. And then I analyze with any vivo 12 software. 
as I mentioned before, the location of this study is located in Romania, Ruj Napoca. Romania, it's uh, one of the countries in East European. And Ruj Napoca is the sec uh, second biggest uh, city in Romania. So, uh, short demographical data of participants. I had uh, 21 customer support representative young people working as uh, uh, front right to frontline employees. And I had also eight team leads, four manager, all working in out outsourcing uh, corporate. So uh, the key findings uh, are as follows. Uh, participant describe employability as uh, owning knowledge, skills, and attribute required in the world of work. Also, the uh, second biggest uh, description, uh, rate and probability as a means to know how to accomplish job responsibilities. The last one, and probability refer to the ability and the willingness to search and maintain employment. So uh, I just choose some specific quotes from the interviews that I did where they were uh, describing employability as uh, essential skills that a graduate has and the capability to use them, such as uh, communication, organization, commercial awareness, and uh, personal skills. Also, uh, Justina, a 25 years old, the customer support representative, described the employability as a competence to maintain an employee position and get the job you might like. Employee, employability is the possession of aptitude that help acquire a job and remain productive in a turbulent world of uh, world of significant change. Employability also it is the possession of the proper mindset to learn and to guess what to improve and to do the best you can. Employability encompass graduate knowledge, skills, and understanding that they indicate the value of employee to employer. Uh, a discussion on the result, uh, we can start saying that employability is about possessing uh, necessary skills, attributes, and knowledge. And probability also is a process, which it's not, it's something uh, dynamic that can just be elaborated uh, within time. And uh, and probability uh, depend on your position in the labor market. If there are many uh, graduates with few jobs, the competition will be uh, tough. So, uh, your position will depend on your level studies, your experience, your possession, and so forth. We have seen that employability rests on employer, employer expectation. Yes, when conceptualizing employability, which with consideration of employable graduate who might fulfill employer demand, these uh, Types of uh, describing improbability coincide with improbability through a political uh, perspective. Improbability also uh, it is a policy concept. Participant uh, described improbability interchangeably as uh, graduate work readiness, graduate attribute, exceptionally in the outsourcing company, soft skills remain more important uh, to describe uh, employable graduate. Employability is extensively described based on a micro, if I can say individual level, and less on macro level. 
labor market supply and demand characteristic. Here, we see wherever uh, we are discussing about the employability, many people tend to be based only on knowledge, skills, possessed by an employee. But few will be discussing about macro uh, characteristics such as the composition of labor market, the competition that is in the labor market, and most uh, and the policy available for uh, integrating young graduates in the labor market. We have found that employability concept is a multidimensional phenomena, simultaneously confusing and misunderstood. Misunderstand. Why? It's because uh, it's theoretically a good concept, but ill-defined, sometimes exaggerated by the press, and dropped on by employer and the numerous, numerous uh, policy maker. For instance, some are uh, comparing employability as employment, but for sure it is possible to be employable yet unemployed or underemployed. The sporadic interpretation of employability greatly impacted the employability practice. As uh, concluding remarks, employability is widely regarded as ability to obtain, do, and search for employment. Yes, being employable may require skills, attributes, and knowledge. However, as I mentioned, it is possible to be employable, yet unemployed. unemployed. Employability remains the most misused concept in the knowledge-based economy. As I mentioned before, employability is widely regarded as a policy concept. As the desire to have a knowledgeable positive society make the concept of employability more politically uh, motivated. Employability terminology are like to be strong defined based on the nature of employment context based on the nature of employment, based on the context, concept, context uh, such as job markets, a specific industry, they have their specific uh, terminology, education and training, they have specific uh, terminology and entrepreneurship. And employability terminology also can be uh, defined based on micro, meso, and macro factors. Employability is a complex notion that requires continuous redefinition. Employability is a lifelong career process that requires the interconnection of different stakeholders to its usefulness. Thank you for uh, having me. As I mentioned, uh, I'm Gonzaga Sravahenda, and uh, I would welcome your uh, question and recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Megan, and thanks everyone. And to say, um, in some ways, I'm wishing I could be there in person, but to say, given it's a, a big event today for me personally as well, and say, I've, uh, I'm joining you from uh, um, the lovely South Island, New Zealand, uh, in fact. Um, so I'm actually talking today about um, the sort of continuation actually from last year's um, uh, symposium, uh, picking up on work we've been doing subsequent to the um, last year's symposium and, and um, uh, really looking at how we can drive forward an agenda for vocabularies and the vocabulary ecosystem in Australia. Now, I'm speaking here on behalf of uh, many people, uh, including you know, a number of your hosts um, here in the, in the last couple of days. Um, you know, in, including Natalia, Megan, uh, Dougie Boyle, um, uh, uh, Leslie, uh, uh, Kieran, uh, and, a, and a host of others. So 
let's say it, it's uh, say this is certainly a group effort um, that we're looking to here, and it's a uh, it's a community effort we're looking to engage everyone with. So I want to bring everyone up to speed onto where we've come to um, with the uh, the roadmap itself and its its imminent release. Um, so. As I say what we wanted to just kind of want to cover through today. I've got more slides than I intend to actually present, but let's say I'm going to sort of give an overview of what we're trying to achieve with the roadmap here. Um, so why we want a roadmap. Um, our idea of so really thinking about the vocabulary ecosystem in Australia uh, and, um, and and how it works. I might just turn my video off. I'm getting an unstable signal. So I'm going to leave it um, as um, video off. Um, the priorities for the roadmap. Um, and the next steps and your participation, what we'd like to uh, get your involvement going into the future. Okay, so um, I, we've included a definition of you know vocabularies broadly in the uh, the roadmap document itself, and you may agree or disagree with this. What we're trying to do is really cover the you know the the gamut of what we might consider vocabularies, ontologies, uh, thesauri, uh, controlled lists, etc. Um, really trying to think you know pretty much about um, sort of the range of things that might be considered within a you know, sort of a vocabulary ecosystem itself. Um, this is a definition that actually comes from the Getty Museum, who you know. Uh, have developed one of the major uh, arts and humanities vocabularies. Um, and as I say, it's a working definition for us. But the point point being here is what we're interested in is really trying to, to look at how we can coordinate the community um, of vocabularies, users and, and infrastructure providers here in Australia and internationally. Uh, and for this, we sort of drawing on the idea of trying to, you know, um, develop a, re a roadmap for actually a vocabulary ecosystem, not what anyone should do with one specific vocabulary, but how we might coordinate our ecosystem more generally. We have the challenge here in Australia that our um, ecosystem is diverse and largely uncoordinated. We don't have a particularly clear mechanism for able to coordinate activities between folks with different things. And that, that includes coordinating with our international colleagues, a number of whom are presenting in this session as well and throughout this uh, throughout this workshop. Um, and that's a challenge that we're, say, really is the focus of what the, the, the roadmap itself is trying to adjust. So we're trying to frame up, well, what might that, you know, a functional and, and effective vocabulary ecosystem actually look like? Uh, what are its constituent parts? And uh, what are some goals we can look to in the short, medium and longer term that we might want to achieve as a vocabularies community to, to better coordinate and progress our ecosystem of vocabularies and vocabulary services? As much as this is, is really to, you know, to orient around, particularly around fair vocabularies, you know, it's, it's if we can't, you know, we have difficulty even finding a lot of the vocabularies we might want to use and what makes makes for a good vocabulary, let alone being able to think about accessibility, interoperability and so forth. So it's, the, it's this diversity and this coordination that really we're trying to emphasise. So why why then the roadmap? I say this came out of as, as I kind of mentioned last year's vocabulary symposium. It's really where the the work started. Um, the uh, following on from the symposium, which is the, the the public event, we actually had a workshop of about thirty colleagues uh, with uh, sort of with you know, high level expertise and interest in vocabularies, and you know this included vocabulary developers, users, um, uh, infrastructure providers, and the like uh, to follow on to explore how the ecosystem might be made more sustainable and broadly used. <laughs> and so they, were, they ranged in, you know, from government to academic to um, uh, uh, some of the consultant and, and developer uh, communities here in Australia as well. Um, a subset of this group has met on a regular basis since that foundation workshop with the aim of establishing a roadmap for the future of vocabularies in Australia and more broadly internationally, because many of us are tied into international communities and need to be able to facilitate access to those communities effectively. So the roadmap is intended to be our shared view of what a vocabulary ecosystem might look like, what are the key elements of that ecosystem and means for achieving what that future state might be. And it's a, it's a shared vision we're looking to bring others uh, on board with as well. So we take the idea of an ecosystem and say, and, and, and say, how do you know how do we coordinate the ecosystem as a whole? A vocabulary in and of itself is an inherently useful thing because it helps us to organise knowledge and terminology. Uh, and you know, a lot of our users and a lot of our vocabulary developers are actually um, not that interested in the, the technology provision itself. It's the coordination uh, and management and expression and instantiation of knowledge that really drives their interest here. 
and the use of that knowledge in a consistent way between users, organizations, and system. The vocabularies, however, exist within a broader ecosystem of usage from a, you know, SA, and we can really think about that from anywhere from a simple controlled list within a single organization right through a commonly held and used terminology across an increasingly broad stakeholder group. So we take this essay idea from colleagues um, who've been working in the environmental sciences uh, and, and before that, um, some work that was done by McCreary. Um, so uh, more recently, this is a paper that's about to be published in Scientific Data, um, which looks at the, the idea from, you know, the semantic ladder of the types of vocabularies and you know uh, ontologies and the like that uh, that we'd be interested in coordinating, and we can start right down from the bottom there from the simple control vocabularies through the complex you know forms of ontologies that might get used in some of the uh, some of the domains. Um, ocean sciences, for example, is uh, is where this being heavily used. Uh, they might be more or less expressive. They might be more or less complex. They might be more or less um, you know, uh, heavily governed in, the, in, in, the, in their operations. We need to be able to you know, understand the, the gamut of the, those vocabularies and allow different vocabulary providers to situate themselves within the ecosystem as a whole. So what then do we think is it within a vocabulary ecosystem? Well, I say, and this I say, the National uh, Information Science Organization uh, in the US has been thinking about this as well. So we're really tapping into a, um, a coordinated um, activity uh, internationally here. Um, they've, they've got a nice definition of how they've, they've been describing this, a broadly distributed ecosystem for vocabulary creation, maintenance and use based on a commonly agreed URI infrastructure to support distribution of terms to consumers based on their explicit preferences. So they've been thinking about you know, what's required there and thinking about some of the, um, the elements of the ecosystem. We've kind of picked this up and tried to articulate it a little bit more um, explicitly as to what are the things we think probably need to be coordinated here in Australia. So we articulate uh, half a dozen um, elements of, of what we see as sort of the, the, the major part of the ecosystem here in Australia that we'd like to be able to you know, bring together and, and, and compare and coordinate activities within the community. Uh, and That's I'm going to work my way. Steve. Thanks, minutes, Megan. Steve. Yep. Um, so I'm going to work my way quickly through these and just give you a highlight of you know, where we're heading next. So the, half, the, the six of them um, that, that we've kind of identified within the, the space here, um, uh, I say, I'll, and I'll, I'll summarize these quickly as stakeholders, governance, skills, standards, infrastructure, and tools, and policy as sort of the, the, the six parts here. What we're saying here is, I say, is, is there's a maturity that comes um, as you develop an, a vocabulary, and that your reliance upon your integration into the ecosystem increases as you progress through the development of your vocabulary. Early on in the piece, it's really about instantiating, instantiating, and representing you know, knowledge effectively. So the priority here is really subject matter skills. But as we grow in terms of the, the firstly the use and then the development and governance of um, and uh, maintenance of your vocabulary, you increasingly start to engage with the different parts of the ecosystem uh, in, in more and more complex ways. And the demands that are put upon how people access and use and seek to integrate with your vocabulary become increasingly complex as well. So in the, the paper that we were developing that we'll be releasing, uh, we hope soon, we, we go through and try and articulate firstly a vision and a mission um, really trying to you know, focus on the next 10 years, so the utility vocabularies is well understood and a burgeoning ecosystem of vocabularies and services um, perform a key foundation of the data assets that we use here in Australia. Mm -hmm. So our mission is going to be to you know, focus on the further consistency and sustainability development, implementation and use of vocabularies across the domains to allow us to solve real world problems. We go through and try and provide um, uh, some basic principles uh, in the paper itself um, so there's some examples up on the screen here, focusing on vocabularies, a representation of knowledge, focusing on the, you know, providing the means for people to be able to support the transmission of vocabulary rather than necessarily having to be, you know, um, expert in the technologies, um, and uh, the management of use of vocabularies themselves. Um, we're looking increasingly look from human to machine interoperable services. 
So humans are not the consumer here, it's actually machines. And how do we facilitate those, you know, the transmission between machines effectively? So humans become the end consumer, but not the point of contact for the vocabularies themselves. And there's, a, and there's about nine vocabularies to try and put there. The last one you can see down the bottom there, really trying to be able to provide an ecosystem that provides, builds and maintains trust in the vocabularies that people want to use so they can find them, effectively access them and interoperate them in a, in a suitable way. We go through and we, yep. We go through and try to provide some definitions of, of what each of those um, uh, um, uh, components of the ecosystem are. So I've got a summary and you can you can see the, the slides are online. You can have a bit of a flick through as to what those ecosystem um, elements are. As I said, standards, vocabularies, governance, infrastructure and technology are supporting the sets of demands that the organisers um, and users place upon the system, the stakeholders have of the system. And then policy, which kind of provides the framework under which, you know, um, vocabularies can be used. We then conclude with a series of um, uh, uh, setting directions, trying to provide short, medium and long term goals for each of those components of the ecosystem itself. And this is where we're really looking for input from the community itself. What we've tried to articulate from each of the subgroups that we've had there is a set of short and medium and long term goals. We'd like your input on those to get a sense of how you feel about those, that we captured the right information, that we kind of reflected those, and you'll see those as sort of three or four um, um, uh, sets of goals for each of those timeframes. And then looking forward to the future, publishing the first draft of the roadmap Hopefully, probably in the next month um, is, is kind of what we're looking to here. We hope to have it ready for the, 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 the workshop here. We're not quite there, but we're pretty close. So when we publish this here, and we, we'd like to be looking out and, and we welcome feedback from the community itself on have, you know, have we covered the right ground in terms of what you think is the constituents of our ecosystem? Do you need clarity on any, any definitions of what we're trying to define here? Do you have any particular priorities of the vocabulary the ecosystem that you'd like to see furthering? Uh, and who do you think this sort of roadmap ought to be going towards, looking towards the future is the orientation is there. So that's an update on where, where we stand and, and the, the roadmap that's there. You can look forward to seeing the roadmap in the very near future. And we'll look to circulate that to this community and the um, say the, uh, the groups, the, the attendees of the conference and last year's um, symposium as well um, to circulate for your uh, feedback in the near future. And that's it for me, Megan. We we Thank have this presentation. We need the opportunity to present our thoughts on ontologies in the age of large language models and navigating their political dimensions in industry applications. Before we dive into the subject matter, we would like to acknowledge the Wajuk people as the traditional owners and custodians of the area of Bulu, Perth, on which Curtin and UWA Perth campuses in the CSIRO Kensington site are located, and pay our respects to their elders and senior knowledge holders, past, present, and those following in their footsteps. Overcoming the ambiguity of language is a centuries old quest. The flood of information and the promise of machine actionable data and services have made this quest even more urgent and attractive. However, attempts at a semantic web have only seen low level of adoption. The vision of the semantic web was formulated early in the internet age, once the web became too large to be mapped in guidebooks. The W3C developed a fra technical framework for the semantic web, but applications were lagging and some implementations never materialized. The semantic applications we see today were driven mainly by search engine operators. But when you look at the right hand end of the Google Trends graph at the bottom of the slide, you can see an uptick of interest in ontologies marked in blue and knowledge graphs marked in red. Why is there this sudden renewed interest in knowledge organization? Industrial facility assets are documented in huge volumes of documents. How can they be consumed and organized? By relentless reading, building business logics, manually constructing knowledge graphs? 
Companies have worked on enterprise data systems, but controlled and uncontrolled systems continue to exist in parallel. Centralization of data in the cloud made data more available, but it did not add any further degree of order. Current systems still suffer from a limited use of agreed semantic elements, and systems are commonly bespoke, closed, and company-specific. Going back to the internet, the internet is full of unstructured text, multilingual and distributed. Yet the internet works. We can find things on the internet. Key elements that help us are the resource description framework and schema.org to provide context to the data in the web pages. Other factors driving adoption are that the technology should be easy to implement and data are available. As an example, services based on location data had a difficult start. Government surveys were asked to sell data for profit and implementing services based on geolocated data was error prone. A small but elegant simplification in the encoding made working with geolocated data much easier. At the same time, governments realized that there would be more economic benefit from open geolocated data than from any attempts at selling them. These changes opened the doors to a large variety of location-based services we use today. I've showed this graph before and pointed out the recent rise in interest in ontologies and knowledge graphs. Search engines have shown the usefulness of knowledge graphs to provide context to search queries. Knowledge graphs are now also seen as a way to improve the outputs from generative AI by acting as guardrails for AI. At the same time, Large language models can also be used to extract ontologies from large text corpora. The elegant hack for using knowledge models in industrial applications is to recognize the layers of scope and delegated responsibility. These graphics show how IKEA delegates the responsibility for providing and curating parts of their knowledge graph. Only the top of the pyramid, the high level concepts are centrally curated. All further, more detailed categories are delegated to agents in their supply chain. The key aspects here are, leave existing data where it is, treat relations as first class citizens, each data gets a clickable address as URL, adhere to the same abstract concepts as used on the web. Add business specific concepts using ontologies. Standardization can open the door to new solutions based on a common standard. Early proprietary internet protocols were soon replaced by common open protocols. The W3C and the Open Geospatial Consortium are examples of organizations working on common open protocols that enable an entire online economy. Standardization can also be a tool for exclusion. It can close the door to alternative solutions based on a competing standard. It can build a moat around a company to protect its competitive advantage. As an example, we have competing standards separating the Android and iOS worlds. Similarly, information structures can be used as tools of exclusion. The standardization of high-level ontologies for industrial applications has the potential for excluding alternative models. 
incompatible structures can lead to exclusionary structures. We already see manufacturers in the agricultural sector trying to build moats around their products. There are lessons we can learn from the second wave of the semantic web. As an analogy from geolocate data, the political push towards open data and key technical simplifications of geospatial data protocols opened the doors to a widespread use of geolocated data and created a vast array of new opportunities for geolocated services. To conclude, the current interest by industry in ontologies is driven by the need to extract knowledge from vast troves of unstructured data. Ontologies can act as guardrails for generative AI to improve the quality of results. Large language models can also be used to extract ontologies from large text corpora. Some industry sectors are starting to push for standardization of high-level ontologies. The risk of these standardization efforts at this stage is that they could act as barriers to alternative solutions. The example of geolocated data shows how policy and technology development can come together to open new opportunities for new products and services through open data and open standards. Thank you for your interest in ontologies in the age of large language models and navigating the political dimensions in industry applications. For more information about technical language processing, please see our website at www.maintenance.org.au. Welcome, Jean Kay. Clement. Hello, everyone. Sorry. So can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes, we can see you. OK. So OK, let's go. Well, uh, yes, indeed, my name is Clément Jonquet, and I'm from University of Montpellier and INRAE in France. Uh, and I'm working with um, ontology repositories and and um, and uh, semantic web technology for for a few years for a few years now. <clears throat> uh, I'm presenting here you a paper about ontology repositories, and we also call them semantic artifact catalogs. There is an expression coming up in in Europe uh, more and more to encompass all of the terms behind the vocabularies, terminologies, uh, tesserae. Uh, so the term of semantic artifact has really evolved, um, been proposed in the context of EOSC, one of the one of the founding uh, program for this work. So I've had the chance to present this paper at the International Semantic Web Conference about a week ago, and I'm giving you by, uh, some of um, uh, uh, a version of that presentation also, so presenting the, the, the same idea. Okay, so let's go. I wanted to just say a word about the funding of this project, just to give you the, the, the names of the project behind that, then include a few elements on ontology repositories, and then present you the Ontoportal Alliance, the, the, the group, the community that is developing such a, such a, such a work on ontology repositories. And I have more, even more slides, but that about the portal that we developed called AgroPortal. So the part of this project is funded by a national project that we have in France called D2CAP for data to knowledge in agronomy and biodiversity. And in this project, we are developing that agroportal platform, that instance of Ponto Portal for, for, um, for agri-food, and also knowledge, different knowledge graph in the notion in the notion of agronomy and biodiversity with multiple partners in France. And we are also founding part of this work also in the context of a project called Fair Impact, which is a a project of the European Open Science Cloud Roadmap in France, in which we have a dedicated work package to metadata and ontologies, in which we try to improve or create a, a, a framework in which semantic artifacts will be used by different communities um, and uh, and the tools and methods, the governance for, for, for relying on, on those vocabularies uh, and, and ontologies and, and the terms of semantic artifacts is also used there, uh, is being uh, set up. So the European Open Science Cloud is a, a very big program from the European Commission. 
uh, with at the, at the core of, of, of this vision, the notion of open science and the adoption of the FAIR principle. And uh, of course, to adopt the FAIR principle, then semantic vocabularies, semantic artifacts are, are indeed very important. Just give you a few elements re re related to um, related to ontology repositories. So, I mean, you all know that ontologies are spread out in different formats, different size, different structure, increasing from increasing, there are an increasing number for overlapping domains. They come with different uh, uh, representation language. They come with different semantics. And of course, they overlap. So this is a, uh, an illustration that really motivated us to understand that building ontology repositories or semantic artifact catalogs, as we also call them, really help us to address the FAIR principles. So the, the previous talks really mentioned also that vision of FAIR vocabularies and, 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 and the symposium is very much about that. So it's been a few years we argued on the fact that you don't have FAIR data if you don't have FAIR vocabularies. And on developing ontology repositories is one of the key elements, one of the key steps in making those vocabularies FAIR. You can find them access them, make them interoperable and reuse them. And the screenshot that you see on these slides are really taken from the platform that we develop based on the onto portal technology that I'm mentioning here. So originally, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with uh, uh, BioPortal. Originally, we had that platform called that we nicknamed a one stop shop for biomedical ontologies. It was about 15 years ago now, a little bit more. And um, the idea was really to build a repository for biomedical ontologies, make them findable, accessible, and also serve them, not only deal with their the listing of their metadata and their cut on the catalog, but really like offer services for their content. So we index the, the, the content, we'll serve, provide a search service, people will be able to, to browse them, discover the, con the their content and align, uh, see the alignment between them, et cetera, et cetera. The impact, the impact that BioPortal had in the community was quite big. Uh, you hope some of you may remember also the Link Open Data Cloud, and that was the that was the version of 2000, maybe 15, something like that. When the when eventually all of the resources being published and produced by BioPortal were end up in the cloud. And uh, and so we change literally change the, the the face the familiar face of that link open data cloud. That's just to illustrate the impact that working on such a project for years, gathering all of the vocabularies and ontologies in a domain, will have on on such a on such a, a concept on the web of sharing um, uh, link data. So we built we built an, an, an architecture for a generic um, onto portal system. So a system uh, um, uh, a system to really serve ontology uh, uh, ontologies. We mostly use the term ontology because historically ontologies were the key um, or the, the master element. But more and more vocabularies have been added, including SCOS vocabularies, and we also now have a full support in agro portal of the of the SCOS format. So all of these components, I'm not asking you to revise that architecture, but just wanted to mention that from the application on the top, including the UI and of course the, the web application, the, the web services layer, then we, we have that business logic that is implemented mostly on really, but also in the back end, the triple store. We do think it's super important to continue uh, uh, provide our services, basing all of our technology on, on, a, on a triple store that store the, the, the ontologies in the back. So from that, um, <clears throat> sorry, from that um, architecture, all of those components were packaged, quite complex components. All of them are available on GitHub for years and years. But eventually, about nine, 10 years ago, they were packaged into something called the NCBO virtual appliance and eventually the onto portal virtual appliance. And the appliance was really a, is really the package of that technology that we can have to reuse the to reuse the onto portal technology and develop your own uh, uh, your own software that's what more or less what we are doing now with the uh, alliance so so the alliance it is the gathering of the different groups working on on the on the on the technology behind and so we try to promote uh, semantic service services based on on, on the on the, on that shared technology so that bioportal was generalized uh, the, and we eventually start working with with it in different domains, like including the, for example, um, the biomedical domain, but with a focus on the French language. That was one of the projects we had in Montpellier about two, about ten years ago. Uh, and then eventually in other areas, 
like agronomy, ag uh, agri-food, um, and, and others join after that, uh, ecology, biodiversity. I'll show you the, the slide after that. But that really, the generalization of BioPortal was at the beginning. The history of the Alliance evolved evolves with the numbers of uh, partners uh, joining eventually and the new portals being developed on the right. Uh, we, we now have a, some kind of an established um, a little group that walk, that works together. And really, um, we have those workshops that we organize now. And, and uh, we really think something happening in the uh, um, something happening in the fact of developing together a, a shared project. I'm, I'll show you a little bit more there. So really, the motivation of the Alliance is really to mutualize the research and development efforts. Uh, we want to maximize that onto portal value, the, the state, the, the portfolio of the services that we offer. We want to consolidate the software, manage that software with several people. Uh, we want to increase the semantic uptake. So every time we had a new party or a new a new group, then we know that we are reaching out to other peoples that are not that were not necessarily in the realm of semantics before. And we're also thinking in terms of finding a model for long-term operational and financial health of our ecosystem. So oh, you see different organizations have adopted uh, the technology to develop portal in different domains, uh, from biodiversity and ecology to the biomedical domain, of course, but also industry, material science, or more recently, earth sciences. Um, and those are the adopters of the technology to provide what we call public domain-specific ontology repositories. But I will show also with a slide at the end that's not only the our users, but those are typically the users of the Alliance, the members of the Alliance. So I just give you two illustrations. AgroPortal is the, the, the ontology repository that we develop at INAE uh, in Montpellier with different partners. Uh, it allows you to publish, search, download, browse ontologies. You have those peer review mechanism, versioning. You can deal with an annotation service, a recommender service. You can have a mapping repository, uh, note mechanism, feedback mechanism. You can also enter the project using ontologies or to demonstrate how they are alive and things like that. And our focus in AgroPortal is on agri-food. I'm illustrating here with another one from the industry domain could developed by colleagues from from. Um, or a European project called Onto Commons. Those are focusing on the on, <clears throat> on the industry domain. So just showing here the, the fact that we have been developing also at different, different pace. In AgroPortal, for example, we are always in line with the Onto Portal technology, but we have added a mu many features. So we are progressing onto new uh, proposition from, from the metadata model to the announcement of the annotator service, the fairness evaluation, et cetera. And, and we try to maintain that and then eventually offer that, that those new contribution to the group. So if I give you one example of the things we are doing, we are doing, for example, in AgroPortal, and that is it's good illustrating, a good illustration of how we pass things from one community, one group to the others. We have now something called the OFAIR, an ontology fairness evaluator um, inside AgroPortal. So you've seen that first slide where I'm arguing that ontology repositories help um, help uh, to do to make a of ontology fair. So we wanted to kind of demonstrate that. So we have developed a method uh, that is published with a bunch of uh, question and test uh, to find out if uh, vocabulary and the fair all the fair principles applies to vocabularies and ontologies. And we have implemented that method almost completely in, in AgroPortal in a tool called OFFAIR. If you go to the portal now, you'll see a, a mechanism and then explanation, a lot of explanation on how we deal with the metadata record that we have in Autoport, in AgroPortal you know, to, demo, to, to calculate or, and, and then find out a score um, that we call a fairness score. And on the right, you see all of the adopters that have <clears throat> in the alliance that have adopted this code interacting with us. This is not trivial. I mean, this is not happening in a in a click, but we are working toward that, sharing the code and making sure that our 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 meta models are aligned and can be reused by can be reused by others. One minute. So in a few words, we are really working on making onto portal a real open source project, adopting the code and principles of open source project. Everything is on GitHub from the documentation that everyone can contribute to to hold the code. And we are trying to, to consolidate that vision also of having everyone contribute to that. The membership is really increasing. Uh, I wanted to mention here the fact that we have nine public repositories, the one that I've illustrated, but we have also users using the technology in the different contexts. For example, hospitals taking the technology to run services like the annotator, annotating some text data on their resources. 
uh, without without running the service um, uh, running the service in house because the data cannot go uh, uh, on the network. So those so those those are examples. So we know we have implemented some features to 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 let the box being deployed let us know that they are alive, and. and um, and we know that we have a, we have at least a, a, around 60, 80 resources re, platform running uh, everywhere on earth. So finally, we've set up those Auto Portal Alliance workshop uh, starting in 2022, 20, uh, in 2020, and then in 2022, 2023. And we are more and more people a year, and we are really developing a group, starting an activity. So, so uh, that's really also a call for looking at what we are doing and eventually joining us. You'll get more information on the website. Uh, talking about the technology, the product itself, and, and the alliance pushing for that product, and that um, um, international semantic web paper that I did mention that was published last week too. Uh, in conclusion, I will say, well, we are really um, welcoming feedback, so feel free to to, to send us uh, your your comment, uh, uh, possible interest or declaration of, of a community that you know could be eventually interested in adopting the the technology. Um, of course, I'm super happy to participate in the symposium in Australia also today because I know there are a lot of things happening here. The two previous presentations have did, did mention it and did show it, and the whole workshop is also illustrating it. So I'm also very eager to propose or show that the auto portal is a, um, something that that could be also a consider uh, a tool to be considered uh, in the different ontology or vocabulary project in Australia. Every time we have a uh, our overall goal here in Europe, at least in the context of EOSC, is to try to have a, a proposition to make Onto Portal deployable at the click of the mouse for a project of a community. So you'll come, you say, oh, we want a, an ontology repository. And in a few clicks, you can get that deployed on a certain infrastructure and use the ontologies you want inside. Uh, every new community brings new ideas. We like that. So it's really a call to participate because we know that every time we have new people, new community, we have a new vision on the way to use vocabularies, etc. Federated okay, portal. Yes, we are working on it, and, and exchange with other communities are also coming. And and I think I'm 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 I'm. I'm, I'm okay, yeah, here we, are. Yeah. we need to wrap up here. Thank you, Clement. Thank yeah, you no worries. Awesome. Okay, cool. So um, I would like to show you today a software that we have been working on that we started to develop um, recently that is supposed to, to help um, the everyday researcher create fair data um, from scratch. And let me start off with my background to this. So um, I'm working for the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration, which is a, uh, a, pro uh, a project of the Research Association, of the Helmholtz Research Association of German Research Center. And uh, overall, we're trying to make uh, the research data in Helmholtz more fair. So I started two years ago, and I learned about, uh, uh, as a metadata developer that was the, the position what it was called and so i started off with learning about rdf and then graph data and i was um, i was very intrigued about having this uh, technological opportunity to connect data and metadata in graphs i, I liked that uh, thought and um, next i learned about ontologies and uh, so I, I saw those as, as tools to standardize terminology and uh, document terminology, right? Because you can, for each term, you can store and connect definitions and descriptions, examples, synonyms, and so on in a structured matter. So that uh, looked really great. But then as time went on, um, I, well, I noticed a lot of, um, People were talking a lot about data publishing, about fair data publishing, but not so much about creating data in a fair manner. It was more like, well, now we want to publish our data, let's make it fair for that, but somewhat after the fact. Um, and I also was kind of expecting to see terms from ontologies or vocabularies in directly in the data. So for example, having an ontology term in the column header of, of a spreadsheet, but um, that was really rarely the case, at least for that, for that which I was able to, to see where I was at. So um, 
we started to to develop an idea for for some software that would uh, deal with these kind of issues um and in order to see how we can now standardize data uh, with software let's start from what a contemporary data set looks like so right now uh, in a very simple scenario we have a table here on the left side with some columns an id column uh, and intensity here is an example for some some property or some things uh, a duration and maybe with with the units here right so for example seconds for duration and second and then we might have maybe hopefully uh, a metadata file um, in this case this is a, a text file that has a little bit of free text and some structured metadata so here's structured metadata the device uh, an operator and, and the project that the data in the spreadsheet should belong to um, but as you can already hear this is um, the link is not super strong and um, there is no standardization here yet whatsoever this is all just all just text so then a first step would be to use terminology from ontologies or vocabularies in well for these properties that are listed in this table here for example the intensity and the duration and vocabulary for these units that would be great um also for the information in this text there are some some properties in there that correspond to that could correspond to ontology terms uh as well as the the properties in this uh, in this uh, structured metadata like a device an operator project those could all be terms that from an ontology that have an id that have a label the name description and so on uh, said before so uh, if we could even just have a, a software that would allow us to to create a table and to create a metadata file in this manner right that would already be great so you would you would type in your column name and um you would then select from a list of ontology terms and click on the click on the right term and then it would be in there and the uh, same here that would already help a lot um as another element of standardization uh, i also show here these um ids so here you can see a researcher called Mel uh, who has some kind of org ID. Um, so standardizing uh, IDs, identification of entities, is also uh, an aspect to this, um, but not so much our focus right now. All right, we are still missing some things. So just selecting terms from ontologies is, um, is partially standardization. However, for the data structure, that is which columns to choose, which metadata fields to use, is not, not yet, uh, that's still free to, free to do uh, for, for anyone who is designing their data. Also, the connection between data and metadata is not yet super explicit. And last but not least, um, having enough and the right columns and metadata fields, that is having data richness, there is also no no instance to control or report on that yet. So what we came up with was that we want to have a software where the user interface looks like this here, as you can see here. That is where you can design your data structure as a graph. You can have uh, tables in such a graph, since, since the table can also in the background still be graph data, that's no problem. But um, you will add some kind of here um, class to this. So you will say what what class are the entities listed in this table. And you can also have single entities like this project here or like this device here. And you will add a class to, to every entity, say what kind of entity it is. Uh, same here with this unit in a second. And then you can have, uh, terms from ontologies in this graph, since we are a very good fit, of course, because ontologies are also graph. And um, you can even incorporate these IDs uh, very easily. 
Um, so these entities ID, entity IDs like an org ID, for example. This um, makes it much easier to link data and metadata because they're already a graph. The structure is quite explicit. So if you create a data structure like this, um, you can uh, easily extract only the structural elements by omitting those value nodes, the value fields. For example, here in this table, you would maybe have some, some numbers in these fields and then the string and those. And you can you can just um say, okay, to this um to this curve here, uh, some kind of data type and unit belongs to it. And that's the, the structural part. And you can just extract that from this graph here. Four minutes, and thank then, you, uh, Leon. Uh, thanks. Yes. Right. And then uh, how do you really uh, harmonize that with others. So we want to embed this kind of um, working on, on graph data sets like these. We want to embed that uh, in a collaborative uh, software structure. So maybe you've probably heard of GitLab or GitHub before. So you can use that to collaboratively uh, work on graph data sets, multiple graph data sets also. Um, so here, one graph data set, second graph data set with different, um, also with provenance tracking, then automatically included. And you can you can have a, a graph database, like for example, a new FJ graph database, and some software that uh, listens or watches all these graph data sets, um, puts it together in one graph database. And then within the, the editor, you can get uh, suggestions on which terms to use. So imagine you're uh, designing your table here and uh, starting to type some kind of column name just from what you have at the top of your head. And it will be able to suggest you um, a meaningful term that others have already used. For example, based on the uh, the usage, the uh, that is how often other people have already used this term or also um, depending on the context in the graph. So just um, which other columns are already in the table, um, the, the big uh, graph will be able to tell, oh, other people have um, used this combination of columns. So maybe this person also wants to use a similar combination. So um, this kind of suggestion algorithm um, will be a complex endeavor, but uh, quite, an, quite an interesting and, and I think useful one. So that is um, that is what we are trying to build right now, um, and this is the the tech stack for the prototype that that we have. So we're doing uh, we're doing this with Docker so that everyone can deploy and, and try the software on their own machine without too much hassle. And this is all supposed to be web based. And the graph data sets will have the JSON ID format since that's fits well with the, the web space. Um, we use GitLab, as I just showed you, a new 4 j database. And uh, for the web front end, we have this JavaScript framework with Strata Kit. All right. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to I questions. want to present to you the Acrobox Thesaurus. Uh, maintained by the by the FAO, uh, but not so much from a technical perspective, but rather from the perspective of, of community involvement and how curation works. As for myself, I'm Daniel Martini. I'm actually from the Association for Technologies and Structures in Agriculture in Germany. Uh, so we are, we are working on knowledge transfer in agriculture mainly. But uh, regarding Acrobock, we have a have a strong cooperation uh, with FAO uh, to to support this this work. So as for the team, actually the presentation I'm giving is a is a is a teamwork of yeah mainly six people that you you can see here. Uh, Emma is actually uh, the team lead at FAO. Andrea is dealing with all the all the technical stuff, uh, maintaining the infrastructure and technology behind it. 
den uh, well main curators are Christine Kolzhus and, and Esther Mitch from from my team at KTBL and yeah then we have uh, Veronica Venturini who is dealing yeah, mainly with community involvement public relations and communications and myself i am kind of bringing in a certain yeah semantic web expertise uh, but as i'm agricultural engineer also also content aspects to give you a little bit of context uh, fao is probably known to most of you it's an it's an organization of the united nations and well its main task is is actually or the main goal is uh, achieving food security all around the world, uh, yeah, dealing with topics that people have enough to eat and food is produced in a sustainable manner. So, and there are, yeah, most of the countries, as as it is in the United Nations, most of the countries are also also involved or represented at FAO. Acrobok actually is a, is a multilingual thesaurus covering concepts and terminology under, under all of FAO's areas of interest. So that includes food, but, but also nutrition and, and yeah, partly health, as long as it's related to nutrition, forestry, also aquaculture. So it's a, it's a broad coverage of topics, actually. The coordination of maintenance is done by FAO, but uh, yeah, curation of terms and concepts is actually done by 34 organizations from 24 countries. The Acrobok currently contains uh, over 40,000 concepts uh, with almost a million labels, so, so translations, and there are currently 42 languages are covered. It's released monthly as a linked open data set and yeah, relying on the linked open data standards. Well, it, it also provides, or there are also some technical services provided uh, to, to deliver the data. So there is a, is a linked data server, uh, but you can also query Acrobook through a Sparkle endpoint. And uh, we use the uh, Cosmos tool uh, for browsing and navigating uh, the term hierarchy. The, um, the curation is done through a tool called Workbench. And all of these tools are, are hosted by the University of Torbergata in Italy. As mentioned, yeah, technical infrastructures is in the hand of yeah, mainly Andrea Torbati. The Acrobook is actually indexed by several semantic catalogs and registries, uh, for example, uh, the Bartok re registry, uh, but also uh, Acroportal, which has been, has been presented by Clement in the earlier talk, uh, contains uh, the metadata on, on Acrobook. Um, well, Acrobook is actually a controlled vocabulary uh, so, so in the sense that Stephen uh, presented it uh, according to the definition of Harpring as a collection of of uh, or, or organized collection of of terms to index resources and make them more findable. Uh, it's it's so it's based on the SCOS standard by W three C. Actually, it's not an ontology, but it contains to some extent also also ontological relations. So, so the acro, acro ontology is accompanying acrobok, and it yeah it provides us a bit uh, yeah how to say it richer means of describing relations between concepts. So, for example, which. Uh, which um, which fruits are produced by which species and and yeah which pests apply to certain certain crops and so on. So yeah, how do we actually build a yeah how to say it a sustainable community and and try to keep things going well. Uh, the FAO carries the responsibility responsibility for the for the six main FAO languages, which are English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian, and it coordinates the editorial activities. 
Technical maintenance is also facilitated by, by FAO, including the publication as a linked data, linked open data resource. However, we're really talking about a collaborative effort and uh, different institutions are responsible either for different language versions of AgroVoc, uh, but, but also the, the different domains that are covered. I will come back to this in, a, in another slide quite in a minute. The work is uh, done on a on a volunteer basis, and the yeah, knowledge sharing with the Acrobook team is rather important. And we do this within our the the FAO and KDBL team, but also also with with the editors. And I will also come back to this aspect a few a few slides later on. Generally, we follow agreed guidelines and standards. And uh, yeah, to dive into this a little bit more, uh, you can see on the right hand side uh, of the slide uh, the AcroVoc editorial guidelines. That is one example of the standards we actually follow. So, so uh, within these guidelines, it is described uh, how we organize the terms in the in the concepts in the hierarchy. Uh, how we deal with uh, with translations of terms and so on. So it's actually curated by the editorial community through a collaborative uh, approach. And yeah, we really try to involve a broad user community, including domain experts, researchers and practitioners from the agricultural domain and not only are there people indexing uh, from the from the library sciences. So there is really, really uh, a big part is involving also the agricultural and, and experts uh, to ensure the vocabulary's relevance. Yeah, for such a large multilingual thesaurus, uh, things like well, resolving ambiguity is really is really a key aspect. It's uh, yeah, in often cases, it's not just translating terms, but but we also have to localize the ter terminology. It's four minutes. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. Well, then we have uh, another another approach that is, uh, yeah, maybe maybe interesting to, to show. Uh, Acrobook actually supports the integration of, yeah, or the technical integration of different domain specific vocabularies, so to say. Technically, this is done as modeling them as as separate cost concept schemes. But they are using the already given URIs from Acrovoc, and uh, yeah, currently there are there are five vocabularies actually integrated into into Acrovoc. It's the the uh, vocabulary on land governance provided by the Land Portal or coordinated by the Land Portal Foundation. Then it's the Aquatic Sciences and Fisheries Abstracts, the ASFA, which has a separate team at FAO. For, for maintaining the vocabulary. Then legislative and policy concepts are integrated from, from FAOLEX and well, this is coordinated by the FAO legal office. Then we have a strong cooperation with, uh, with uh, CGIAR, an organization quite active in, in agricultural research, which is uh, coordinated yeah, by the CGAAR FAO task force. And we have topics uh, concerning indigenous peoples in by the FAO indigenous peoples initiative. So promoting the use is really is really an yeah important issue to us. So so we also we yeah, are trying to demonstrate the benefits, uh, socializing the value of vocabularies. Well, yes, as you all know, using standardized terminology facilitates effective communication and, and knowledge sharing. And yeah, we think by the use of semantic technologies, we can, can really help to, to leverage and safeguard the content work in a, in a, in a portable and, and long-term technically sustainable way. 
Yeah, regarding the outreach uh, for for this and last year, there have been uh, special outreach activities mainly in Latin America, but but we do this all around the world, uh, highlighting dedicated pieces of of Acrovoc content. There is also outreach material available. Uh, we're present on social media, and uh, yeah, through a collaboration with the the FAO country and regional offices. So this is just the example of Latin America, where there have been yeah quite some activities, including including webinars and and user community involvement ongoing, quite recently. One minute, thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. Then, well, we share we share the new concepts which have been added. Uh, each, as as mentioned, there are monthly releases, and we share the new concepts which have been added into into each release. And there is also yeah uh, something that we call the concept of the month, which which highlights an an important concept and and showing its definition. And this is yeah presented and shared on the Acrobook website. Yeah, we're trying to reach different audiences. So not only the website is important, but there are also yeah, collaborative efforts on, on publications like, like this example, together with the Land Portal Foundation on the role of metadata and open data in the innovation cycle of land administration. Then finally, I want to highlight the Acrobook online course, which will be will be uh, published this month. It covers all aspects, uh, reaching from very basic foundations like like information on data sharing, uh, and then going through accessing and using, also hints for editors and for curation. Um, and so on. So it covers the whole range of working with Acrobook. And yeah, Glad to share this with you. And with that, I'm actually finished with the talk. And yeah, you can reach the, the Acrobok team through through the email address acrobok at fao.org. So if you have questions later on, feel free to send them to this email address. But yeah, I'm also available here now for answering questions and for the panel. So thank you. <laughs>